Jackie's Giant Music Show, where I interview and share the music of independent musicians. Today is Tuesday, October 16, 2018. It's podcast number two, and the Lanza Insurance Clock tells me it's time to start the podcast. My guest tonight is recent New York State Blues Hall of Fame inductee, Paul Toscano. Wow, that sounds so... uh Unusual. I've not, I've not heard it like that before. You haven't heard yourself introduced as the New York State inductee. No, I've I've had a couple of people kind of hawk it when when I did a show or something like that. It's not the same as being introduced. So it was kind of interesting. Oh well, I like to be interesting. Well, you know, it's the first time for everything, Jackie. Oh come on, Paul. <laughs> listen, Paul. We have a ton of ground to cover. Yeah, we do. So why don't you? What do you say we start with that music we just opened with? Okay, what we opened up with was uh, "Keep a, a Tight Grip on Your Leash." I think that was the name of it. Yeah, "Tight Grip on Your Leash." That was the Nick Moss band. Nick Moss band out of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, with Dennis Grueling is touring with them. He's been with them a couple of years now. Uh, he's my harmonica teacher. He's out of uh, Dun Allen, New Jersey. Matter of fact, he's leaving, moving to California uh, pretty soon. But so he's touring around with those guys. They do uh, U.S. tours and uh, European tours, and they've been having a ball. They've been just going to town and having a great, great, great time. And they're going to be coming to um, the uh, what's the place down on the water? Oh, Turning Town. Point. The Turning Point uh-huh. on November fifth. Which the I think point. is a Wednesday night. Then he must be pretty well known because I know the Turning Point usually only books people that have a kind of a guaranteed draw. Nick Moss has played at you know Daryl's house and a town crier and 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 um, uh, the Falcon, my other favorite place, and of course um, Black Eyed Sally's and um, and the one I just mentioned. I can't remember Turning Point. I don't know why oh, well- I always do that with the Turning Point. It, it's yeah, I, I I think I also forget it. Maybe Dust doesn't 
jive right in our brain. But let's go backwards to Black Eyed Sally's for a second, because that's where they inducted you into the Hall of Fame. It is not. It is not? That's not where you had your ceremony? No, it was originally going to be held on... July 27th, I think it was, at at the Bijou. But they decided since I was from New York State that they were going to do a New York State one. And that's when they brought in Dylan Doyle, mm-hmm. um, Big Thirsty, Andy Follett, and Willa, Willa Vincentor. So all five of us got inducted that night, and that happened at the Falcon on the 29th of August. That's right. Of course it's right. You were there. I wasn't. So you know the facts. <laughs> So what was that like, uh, getting that reward? It was interesting. It was fun um, because it was a great bunch of folks that I was getting inducted with. Mm -hmm. Um, I I was supposed to be inducted a a few years ago. This guy, Michael Packer, he was the um, New York State Blues Hall of Fame guy. He was a Blues Hall of Fame guy. He did inductions in, in, in Chicago, all over the place. And he told me, he goes, oh, you're getting in the next one, you know, because of all yeah. the stuff you've done, your know, radio show and all that stuff. And, uh, and then he passed on. So it kind of just went by the wayside. And then uh, it got picked up recently and when it was brought to my attention. So to have it at the Falcon was interesting. It was good because Willie was playing upstairs that night. Yeah. Uh, she was getting ready to do um, a big show up in Thousand Islands, I think it was. So she was doing like a, a, a dress, full dress rehearsal at the Falcon upstairs. And downstairs at uh, Petey Hop's Blues Jam, the Roots and Music Jam, he does it every third um, Wednesday, is where they decided to hold um, the Blues Induction, Blues Hall of Fame Induction. So it was a lot of fun. So all the inductees got to play. Several times, which is you don't usually get to do that at the jams. No, that was a lot of fun. We had a great time, and we all ended up playing with Willa that night at the end. And, and, and she's just fabulous. She really is. I saw pictures of the event, and you were dressed up all nice and sharp. I was. Well, the pictures look good. I mean, you look I, like you I was were wearing up. jeans. You had a dress shirt on. I might have had a tidy shirt on. Yes. Yeah. Now. Was your band playing with you, or was it just the uh, other inductees? No, my band did play with me. Special yep. Sauce? Yep. They came up, uh, Kenny on bass, and Doug on guitar, and Alan on the drums. If anybody wants to know their names, it's Alan Copeland, Doug Varity, and Ken Williams. And that's the Special Sauce band? Yes. And you're a blues band? We're actually blues and rock. We do a little soul and funk, too, but more towards the blues and blues rock type of thing. So... I understand that you have a CD that you're working on. Is that with Special Sauce or is that with another band? No, this is a little project um, called Jelly Bean Jake and the Coconut Heads. Ah, that's where that came in. Yes. Where does one come up with a title of a band, Jelly Bean Jake and the Coconut Heads? Oh, that's big Johnny Savage. He's always coming up with crazy names. Who's in this band? So, Doug Abramson on bass. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, Chris Kaiser on drums, myself, uh, Big John Savage on guitar and vocals, and uh, um, Pete Pappas on guitar. So there's two guitars? There's two guitars, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So we just went in the studio back at the end of September, and we spent the whole day there. It was, uh, I can't forget the name now. Oh, it's Jason Sarubi's the engineer, but he's he's got the the um, facility. It's up in New Paltz. Okay, I'm sure it'll Saturday. come to you while we're yeah, talking. I'm sure, yeah, and I'll just blurt it out. That's okay. We <laughs> we like that blurting stuff. Well, you know, we know this from the past working together, right? We've done lots of projects together, and we've had a lot of laughs. Yeah, we did. Would you say doing the live show was fun? Yeah, the live show's still going on because it got silly. <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but I do want to go back to the to your recording uh, with the Jelly Bean Jake and the Coconut Heads, but uh, there's so much to cover that I, maybe we should start at the top of the list. You sent me a nice list. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's, uh, let's start with Blues and Barbecue. So are we going to talk about the past one or the future one? Well, let's talk about the fa- past one because that just passed. Well, why don't you tell the listeners what the Blues and Barbecue Fest is all about and all right. what you're doing? So the Patterson Rotary Blues and Barbecue Festival, it's been its seventh year. And this year uh, was the second full year that I chaired it. 
And it's a two-day festival, and it's I belong to the Patterson Rotary Club. And if anybody wants to know what the Rotary is, we work within the community to try to raise funds to help people who are less fortunate. Uh, we do things at Thanksgiving. We do people, you know, uh, veterans issues, um, uh, you know, women's services, all kinds of things. We've even, we even recently just helped out um, the uh, dog catchers in Putnam County. They needed a new car, so we donated enough money to help them purchase another car. To catch dogs? Yes. It, they can be really bad sometimes. Bad dogs. Bad dog. Bad dog. Yeah, bad dog. Anyway, um, so we raise all these funds, and that's what the fest- festival is all about. But it's also about bringing community together. Mm-hmm. It's a free event. We've never, ever charged for it. And where we make the money is, um, like in food sales. And we also, since we sell beer and wine, we had the beer was donated by Yingling. The oldest brewery in the United States. And if it's free, it's really tasty. It's very good. Even I'll drink that beer. Old and free? Old and free. Old and free. <laughs> Warm, old and free? <laughs> yeah, baby. That's what it's all about. So this year we had uh, 10 bands and then we had acoustic acts in between those bands. Now those 10 bands are spread out over the course of two days, aren't they? Yes, five bands each day. Music starts at noon, ends at 7. Uh, interestingly, though, we're going to end the music at 6.30 in 2019. I saw something that I wasn't happy with. and that, that? As the last band was playing, which was Shorty King, they were absolutely dynamite. And they only come together once a year, and they did it for this festival, and it was kind of cool. They were playing, and the festival was supposed to shut down at 7.00. Well, people at 6.30 are running around packing up tents. The band's still playing. They're breaking down the field. So it kind of irritated me. I know that if I'm playing, I don't want people to just get up and walk out. Well, won't that just cause them to pack up at 6 instead of 7, 6.30? I mean, won't they'll still pack up a half Who was hour packing early? up was the Rotary Club. Well. <laughs> they're the ones that are not supposed to be. Because I know why they were doing it is because um, – in September, you're really losing light after 7 o'clock. Yeah. And the last day of the festival, you know, that's breaking down the stage, everything. I don't get home till like 10 o'clock at well, night. That's a lot of work. Right. So uh, we're got, we'll end the music at 6.30, and this way, once the music stops, they'll be breaking stuff down at the same time. So would you say that the Blues and Barbecue Festival for 2018 was a success? Huge success. We had over 4,000 people through. Wow. Yep. And we just had, we had done in 2017, we've done about 4,000. So then the next one, 2019, it's so hard to say that. It's almost 2020. Um, no, it's almost 2019. Well, you know, it's closer to 2020 than it was last year. Well, you got a point. <laughs> what, um, what kind of numbers are you expecting? Or- I'm expecting bigger numbers because um, I'm... I won't be using the same bands every year. Mm-hmm. You know, like we already signed on Gil Paris. He'll be there. Right. Um, and I have Chris O'Leary is going to play whatever day he feels like playing. And I have a bunch of the ones from last year that I will probably use. But um, do you think it, it makes sense to mix it up with new bands? Or- absolutely. Right. It keeps it fresh because if you keep the same bands every single year, It'll get stale. Stale. What other lessons did you learn uh, f- from doing it the last two years that will be Oh, my God. Upon? You know, it's funny. You're always learning lessons. But you're always surprised at how efficient you become after you do it a few times. Um, you know, there's always lessons. You know, since we do this for donations, um, I came up with this idea one year back in 16. I call it mini. We, we dressed up a mannequin. And we put a cowboy hat on her and, and a guitar that my brother had built, this kind of freakish looking thing called the junk slider. Yeah. And um, it's, a, it's a slide guitar, but there's all kinds of junk tone. There's even a Chrysler emblem stuck to the headstock. Um, and, you know, put a bar, blues and barbecue t shirt on her, sat her on a chair and put a big tin in front of her, and she made $1,000 the first year. $1,000 in donations. 
And and it's just right there when you first walk in, right? Right. So then we said, okay, let's do. We'll add a second um, mannequin. We'll put it over by the stage. Oh, where are you finding these mannequins? You I know, have I know a guy. You know a guy. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Uh oh, that's we haven't heard com- that. That's a commercial. Yes, it is. Well. You want to talk commercials. We actually are working with the Lanza Insurance Agency, which is a State Farm agency. They donated these two clocks that we are uh, watching as we do our interview tonight. I have one right in front of me now. I can feel like I know where I'm at at all times. It's very nice clocks. They are. They did a nice job, didn't they? And we thank the Lanza Insurance Agency for their clocks. Thank you, Lanza Insurance. Um, So... In addition to the Blues and Barbecue Festival, you also do the Brewster Music Festival, which was earlier in the year. How? how that um, was June, yes. That the, the focus of the Brewster Musical Festival is completely different. Musical Festival? Where? <laughs> Bruce, Brewster Music Festival. You say that five well, times fast. How that came about uh, was during one of our Rotary meetings. Uh, we were brought over to the Old Town Hall in Brewster, New York. Uh, It's owned by the studio around the corner, which is the Cultural Arts Coalition. So I met some nice folks over there. Judy Morano is the president. And um, she did a little presentation downstairs in the studio around the corner. And then she says, would you like to see the old town hall? We walk into this incredible high ceiling uh, auditorium, big stage, it has a balcony, and it can seat 250 people. So I'm like, wow, this is gorgeous. Yeah, we're trying to restore it. I'm like, Maybe I can help, you know, because I don't have anything else to do. Well, right? you're retired now, so right. you're— I mean, I don't have anything else to do. No. i got the radio show and the bands and all the other stuff, right? Yeah, and you're going to full here. calendar. So um, I said to Judy Morano, go, hey, what do you think about putting on a festival— we make it free, kind of like we do with blues and barbecue, but whatever donations we pull in, we'll, you know, take that money and, and put it towards it. So we, we put it together between May of 2017 and August. It was, it was two weeks after blues and barbecue, and I was just completely wiped out. We pulled in about maybe 150 people. We had five bands? Four bands, four bands. Um. And we had Kevin Bearsdorf do the sound. He also does the blues and barbecue. Mm-hmm. He's a phenomenal sound engineer if anybody needs him. K-Bay's sound equipment. So the, the first music festival went off uh, the end of September, September 30th, 2017. And like I said, we pulled maybe 150 people or something, 100, 150 people. The next year, we changed up some of the bands. Uh, it was also, oh, it was a lousy day in 20, 2017. I don't, the, I don't the think weather I was really it was one. was it was damp it was a little rainy it really wasn't very nice so this year we moved it to june it was june 9th and how do i know it was june 9th it's because it was my anniversary oh right so it was the second time on my anniversary i was doing a some kind of a gig the first one was we played with uh fresh paint at daryl's house it was on my anniversary so that was in 15 i think that was 16 16 well, you have an understanding wife. Yeah, my wife's the best. Yeah, you better say that. She's not gonna. Li- <laughs> she's not gonna listen to this. So. Well, okay then. <laughs> I'm just Julie. telling this because it's true. Well, so I was at that festival, and aside from the music being great and all the vendors were terrific, the weather was outstanding. Oh yeah, and that um, Wells Park. It's a bit of a natural amphitheater, which Is I it the really- way it's carved into the. Yes. Side. So the stage is at one end, and then it kind of drops down, and then it, and then it slopes back up. And it's really really nice. But we did put a tent over that stage because it got pretty hot up there too. Yeah, the sun was out. I was I ended up going all the way to the back where there was that wall. Yes. And leaning up against the wall because I didn't think to bring a chair, and I fell asleep. <sighs> Not nice. be- it was during the break. See, now you were asking me before about things that we had learned, right? Yes. So one of those things, and now I can morph this into the Brewster Music Festival. So you said you forgot a chair. Right. I said, why don't we have chairs that we rent? rent. And know. then for Blues and Barbecue, I said, why don't we have chairs that we can rent or sell with the brand? Because you know what the brand is, right? The brand of what? The two, um, two days of grease, love, and music. And then oh, that, there's the pig, yeah. pig the holding pig. a spatula that's shaped like a guitar. 
wearing a pair of shades, and it's pretty cool. That's our brand. There's other things that you're putting together and working on. It. Uh, tell us a lot, not tell a little. A okay. Tell us a lot about the Hudson Valley Blues Society and what you're doing there. Oh well, for years now, I. Like, what happened? There's no Hudson Valley Blues Society. I know they got the Mohawk Valley Blues Society, which my brother was a part of up in um, the Utica, Rome area. And I saw that there was one, but I think it died in the early 2000s. So a couple times I talked about it and I said, maybe I should start it, you know. And I never really could find anybody that just wanted to jump in with me. So recently I had, <laughs> we had played at, at um, Black Eyed Sally's on September 8th. And uh, when I was there, I saw Doug Deming and the Jewel Tones were playing there on uh, September 21st, yeah, which was a Friday night. And I'm like, wow, let me reach out to the guys. So I reached out to the bass player, Andrew Goldman, and I said, hey, Andrew, I said, you guys uh, playing in New York? Really? He says, no, nothing's happening. I said, want me to take a look and see if anything's shaking out? And I, do you remember me contacting you about uh -huh, Doug Deming right? and the Jewel Tones? Mm -hmm. So, and you said, call Vic. Right. And, the Heights of Brother Vic. Right. The Heights of Brother Vic took them in there. And um, so when I was talking to the guys, I said, I wish I had a bigger place that you guys could crash because they were looking for a hotel too. Yeah. So um, he found somebody. Hey, friends are there. Heidi's. Hil Hillary, Hillary Fontana. Oh, they were going to say Clinton. No, 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 no. And um, so... Somehow she got wind of I wanted to start up the Blue Society. Well, maybe she, I don't know, but we started talking about it. Yeah. And I met her and her husband, um, a little tavern down in uh, Katona. So I guess like Muscoot. It was the Muscoot. Muscoot Tavern? Yeah. And then we're going to meet up in Peekskill on Friday. Anyway, so we started to put together an agenda of the things that we want to do. Yeah. Memberships and that type of thing. And we are going to take a residence in the studio around the corner, which I'm also on the board of directors of now. In your spare time. In my spare time. <laughs> so with the goal of trying to get bands in, including our own bands, you know, the jam, the, the monthly jam that we do up into that Old Town Hall Theater once it's restored. Mm -hmm. For now, it will be downstairs. In the in the studio around the corner. Yeah, which is a lot smaller of a space. And what is the function of the Hudson Valley Blue Society? Well, to educate people about the art form, to keep it alive, to even go into schools and teach children. You know, however we can promote it to keep that music going because it is, a, 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 without the blues, we wouldn't have what we have today. We wouldn't have any of the music we have today. Right. Isn't that the basis for rock and roll? It is. Even I know that. Yep. It's all from the so, same progression. And it also spawned jazz. Yeah. I think now would be a good time to listen to um, the St. Louis Blues, which is a song that your band is currently recorded, the Jelly Bean Jake and the Coconut Heads band. Yeah. I love that. It's funny. It's it's a good name. You're gonna have to really explain it to me a little bit better. I really can't. It's just something, something that Johnny, Johnny came, came up, up with. with, and you know he's. That sounds like the name of a song Johnny came up with. <laughs> no, that sounds kind of lame, but. Well, I'm sorry. You think Jelly Bean Jake is non-lame? I liked it. We used to have one. Another band was called the uh, Union Stockyard and Transit Company. Yes, I remember that. And my, that my wife guys, there's too many words to remember. I, I agree with her. Actually, but, but Big Brother and a Holding Company, that wasn't too many words, right? That's because they became famous. <laughs>
diamond ring Pull that man round by her apron string If it wasn't for the powder babe And a stove or hell Be such a wicked woman Couldn't take you Jackie and it's Jackie's Giant Music Show. You just heard the St. Louis Blues, and that is a new in the works recording by Rough Cut. Rough, Rough Cut. Cut is that the better way to say it? The Rough Cut or by Rough Jelly Mix. Bean Jake and the Coconut Heads. I'm sitting here with the head coconut head. No, right now. not the head coconut head. No, you're the Jelly Bean. No, I'm not Jelly Bean, but I'm one of the coconut heads. You're one of the coconut heads. That's right. And also a harp player. I mean, we've been talking now for, I think, a half an hour, and we've not mentioned your instrument at all. And it's a harmonica, not a harp, because it's amazing how many people will look at me and still think it's the old harp stringed instrument. Well, isn't that a pair of wings I see on your back? You know, they fell off a long time ago. Oh, it might have got burned off. Devil horns. Kind of <laughs> devil horns, that's what it is. So you want me to say you're playing a harmonica. Oh, well, you could say heart, but somewhere in there you're going to have to, I, harmonica had to be said. It had to be said. I have seen your harmonica collection. You have? I have. Only Probably only a small part of it. I probably have only seen, but I, I mean, we've been working together now since what, 2015 or 16 I mean, when I first met you, we were booking yep. um, the Blues Drivers. The Blues Drivers, yeah. And um, then we moved on to Just a Friendship and then working together on the radio. And now uh, we're trying to find our next project to do. Always looking for another project. Um, you know, okay. As I said, as obviously you're, you're just as bad as I am. You can't seem to fill up your days fast enough. I know. I'm actually cutting back on a few things. Um, but... So let's talk about the song. I loved, as we were just saying, I loved the riff. And that just kind of happened. Yeah. You know? The lyrics were, like I said, I think I mentioned this earlier well, we in some of this book. Off, yeah. Off so it. Johnny just put his music to it. And that riff with the harp and, you know, just kind of happened. It just yeah. worked out really well and it sounds good. It's got a cool sound too. It's catchy. Where did Johnny get this music from? It's in his head. The, he he. I thought you had said he'd heard it somewhere. No no back no in the no day. no. He he read the words. Oh, it was like okay. a, a poetry Please book. Please tell or that something. story over. I forgot it already. Oh dear. Well, what are you going to do with you? 
Well, was you're going some to sort tell of me again. A book, I think it was a book of poems or 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 lyrics that had never had uh, music put to them. So it was the, the St. Louis blues. And he liked those lyrics. And when he started playing around with the melody and all that, it just seemed to fall in together. Does the um, poet get some credit for the lyrics or is it a long gone? That's not my end. I'm That's not worried not about end. it. Oop. Anything, you know, there's a song that Johnny and I wrote. Um, it's called B flat, but it's just an instrumental. I'm not even worried about it right now because it's just, you know, loose recordings, rough mix, that type of thing. I haven't done anything with it. I probably brought that with me too, but. What um is your time frame on the album? You just, whatever it's, whenever you find time to do it. and The plan was to go in there and cut 10. Uh, we cut six that day. So there's four more we'd like to go in and do. Yeah. And then at some point, um, finish it up, get it mastered, release it. Did you figure out where you had done the recording yet? No. No, it hasn't come to you yet? Okay, let's do some math times tables or something. That'll get your brain working in the right direction. No, it won't. No? Good, because I'm not very good at that. Good, but I have my calculator, so. Yeah, well, we all have a calculator in our phones, mm -hmm. right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, Split rock recording. Split rock recording? You New just balls. thought of it. Yeah, <laughs> and see? I told you I would blur to that, split rock yeah, recording. Yeah, because we mentioned math. Yeah, Something Jim about <laughs> math and your mind wants to go elsewhere. And Jason Cerubi is the, Cerubi is the engineer. And they're in where? New Paltz. New Paltz. A fun Paltz? town to get out of on a Saturday afternoon. Oh, really? Why is that? Because uh, it's just jammed with traffic, you know, between the, the students and the parents up visiting the students. And Tourists. it's apple picking season and all that kind of oh, thing. Oh, wait till the leaves start turning. I don't think they're going to turn this year. You don't? No. I think we're Why? a little because late. We're a little late in the season right now, and we're not getting any colors. I'm seeing more leaves come down. What is today? The 15th, 16th? Today is the 16th. Yeah. I have it right here on my notes. Tuesday, October sixteenth, and, I, and I, I don't, I think because we had so much rain, and it was so warm for so long. You know, Paul. Um, sticking with the music, we should talk about one of our other sponsors, yes, and she because I should stay away from meteorology, right? What I should stay from, stay away from meteorology. Well, well, you know. By the time people listen to this, it'll be old news, that weather. That's right. So what did you want to ask? I want to talk about one of our other uh, sponsors, and it's someone that you and I are friends with. Dun, da, da, da. Hearitthere.com. Oh, ah, yeah. And you know the founder of Here It There. Elisa, yeah. Elise Zuckerberg. Elisa. I call her Elise. But Why? Because you forget to call her Elisa? Because, I don't know, for me, I just think of her as Elise. But um, Here It There <laughs> is... Um, a great website where folks go and they can look for music. Yeah, I, I think it's very comprehensive. Yeah. You know, I think she's done a great job. How are you using it? Yeah, I get the emails and then I can look through it and see what's playing in my area. Mm -hmm. I always I use it as a resource now. I don't use anybody else. Do you put your gigs on there? Not yet. Oops. You've told me you have some gigs coming up. Wait, I do. What do you got coming up? I think, are they in November? Yeah, both are in. Well, actually, I'm going to be sitting in with the Robert Cahill Band on Sunday at Pam Pam's on the Water. I think it is. Uh, it's a breast cancer fundraiser. So I'll be sitting in a harmonica with the Robert Cahill Band. That's this coming Sunday. Yep. So I think that's around noontime. What town is that? In Pam's on the Water, Poughkeepsie. Poughkeepsie. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, if I, I can look on my phone if you want to chat for a minute while I look so on my you're, phone. So I was wondering what the Rob Cahill band was. What What is, what's the Rob Cahill band? Obviously a blues band that has No, a, no, no. He's, no? he's. Not obvious. No, it's really not. He does more rock. He writes a lot of his own stuff. Yeah. Um, I sat in with them last week and at his place in Poughkeepsie and I was playing and. All of a sudden, he looks at me and he says, "He goes, man. He goes, you own this song, and it was something he wrote." And a couple of minutes goes by, we're still playing the song, and his wife shows up and she's just standing there with a couple of friends. 
So when we stopped, everybody just started clapping. I said, what? He what? Said, well, what did I do? Because nobody has ever played it the way I wanted it played. So do you think when you start playing and you're getting into a song, you kind of go into like a zone and you just Sometimes. become part of the song? Could Sometimes. you repeat that performance? I better. Exactly the same? <laughs> no, I will never. I never play anything exactly the same. It might be similar or close. Yeah. But I like to change things up. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw you play um, at our Toros when we did the showcase. Oh, my God. And I did not understand what that whole contraption was you were playing. When my In my mind, uh, a harmonica is just a little square, rect- or rather a rectangle, sil- rectangular like silver gun clip. thing that you play after you've done your tongue aerobics and <laughs> tongue then, blocking tongue blocking and then i see this tube thing coming out leading to a box and i thought it was like a breathing machine i'm like what is he is he like need extra air to breathe while he's playing this <laughs> well, well, that's I, a harp i Jackie. am in my 60s well you weren't then yeah you're right yeah so there, and you didn't know what that was at the time I so didn't you didn't know, know that was a microphone and a cable I didn't know, and it took them like a couple years before I finally figured it out. I think Jason Gisser was the one that told me, and I called it the electronic harmonica, and um, he just said, oh, Jackie, <laughs> no, <laughs> and explained to me what it was. But if for those, like you were saying, people that don't know, like I didn't at the time, it, it, it's misleading to say harp, but they were all, you were playing the harp. You were into it, and uh, I still am. You're doing a fine job over there. I wish you'd have brought some harps with you. Why, so I could play it and then go. All right, stop. No, <laughs> no. I like watching you do your thing. It's more fun doing it with the band. Yeah, well, you know. You know, if the band was here, hey, they'd be have fun. We would. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get the band in here one time. Should do that. So you were talking about the Robert K. Hill band, right? So, oh, uh, so on, and that's this coming weekend. Um, I did book a show for traveling Riverside, but I'm not going to be there. That's Friday night. It's at a place called Elsie's Place in Warwick. It's I don't a, know it's a that. new barbecue joint. Um, a mutual friend of ours had asked me if I could get him a band. Um, he he's a photographer. A photographer. Joe Mack. Oh, Joe Mack. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's told me he was booking also. Yeah, he's been booking. But, um... So but, and so I booked those guys yeah. in under the name Traveling Riverside, but I'm not going to be sitting in with them. No? No, but I... We have special... You got to put that up on hearitthere.com. I'm not putting it up because I'm not playing it. Yeah, but I mean, I just you know. arranged the gig. I'm not advertising it. Oh, well, somebody's got to put it in. Well, you gotta, what's the name of the venue? I'll tell Elise. Elsie's Place in Warwick. Elsie's like the ca- cow? Yeah, like the cow. As- it's a barbecue restaurant. Yeah, I guess. You barbecue a cow, right? And it's in Warwick? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, they'll be putting that up on here at there.com for those that want to go to Warwick. And then Special Sauce is playing on the 10th of November at 8 o'clock at the uh, Beacon Elks Lodge. They call it the Jolly Corks Blues Extravaganza. Jolly Cork? Is it Irish? No, the Jolly Corks is is an Elks uh, thing. It was like, I think it was a pub that they had inside the Elks Lodge. So I had found it and nobody had used the name for years. So I called the Jolly Corks Blues Extravaganza and the Elks Lodge loved it. Yeah, well, the, yeah, they, you're they bringing They really back dug some it. I history. did this really cool graphic using their old logo. Oh, I, w- I want to see that. And that are you putting on here at there? Yeah. Okay, don't forget. And then there's a Traveling Riverside Blues Band gig at um, Midnight Cafe in Brewster on the 17th. Is it Midnight or Moon? A Moonlight Cafe. Moonlight. So you've played there before, though, right? That's a At Moonlight? Yeah, I played there with um, Bob Cage. Right. Well, that's where we're heading next. Um, and Traveling Riverside. And Traveling Riverside. So, so that's an acoustic trio that you did there, right? With um, Bob Cage, yes. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about Bob Cage. Um, I had the pleasure of only meeting him and working with him once. That's it? Yeah. Um, he did a musical showcase that we were doing up in Pauling. 
And uh, Adam is going to play a little segment for us of that, which um, I just want to uh, recognize Bob. Bob was a uh, a new friend who recently passed away. Um, you probably have more details. Maybe you could speak on that. Well, I've known Bob since 2014. Yeah. Um, so when we were looking for a guitar player for the blues drivers, um, a friend of mine from Long Island said, oh, you know, I have a friend that lives up there. His name is Bob Cajanese. You know, he's a, he used to play with uh, Little Buster and the Soul Brothers for years. And I said, oh, I remember those guys. So I called up Bob and he says, yeah, yeah, sure. So he comes over to the house and it's interesting. It's nothing like what I expected him to be like because he, he was this big guy, really kind of unkempt. <laughs> but man, when he put that guitar on, he was a spectacular player. Yeah. And in, in addition, he could also play piano, drums, and bass. Really? And violin. So, But he could play uh, straight up fiddle music or he could, you know, do Paganini. You know, that was how that was how talented he was. Um, he was a rough customer as a guitar player. If he didn't want to do something, he wouldn't do it. He'd have no problem flat leaving you. He <laughs> walking and out the, the door. Yeah, he's done it. He'd done it to me. So when I was at his funeral, because he he passed from cancer, he had bladder cancer that he only found out in May. Right, told, right. He told me he was getting better, and even two days before he passed on, I. I sent him a message and see how he was doing. And he said, I got the blues, man. And I said, yeah, man, we all get the blues from time to time. But that was something he used to say to me when he was in the mood to play. Yeah. He'd always go, hey, man, I guess I got the blues. All right. Okay, cool. So I was at his, his, his wake and service and his daughter was there. And it was the first time I had met her. And I don't remember her name, but she was a lovely, lovely young woman. Um, she said, I wrote that. He told me to write it to her, to you. It was on his, oh, really? We were oh, in his, yeah, we were in probably... his deathbed. Uh, and it was, it's a shame because it, I, it could have been avoided, I believe. Um, Bob was the type of guy that didn't really take care of himself. We'd rehearse until like 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and he'd leave and go find two slices of pizza you know, at 64 years old, you can't go, go jamming pizza down your throat at 10.30 at night. It's just oh, not no. a good way to, to live your life. I mean, I as I said, I didn't really know him that well, but what I did know of him was his extraordinary playing, which he did at the um, Music Hall Showcase for us. I'm going to just play a did little you, snippet Did you know his it? relationship with the Epiphone family? I don't know that. Yeah, his, his grandfather was Epi. Epi of the Epiphone. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I forget the name. Yeah, the guitar family, which morphed into you know, Gibson and all the other stuff. It's just ah. really, really interesting. Uh, but he, he hung on that, and he was hoping that you know he'd get a slice of that pie somewhere down the road. Well, he's he's slicing the pie up with his grandpa now. Yeah, they, can have, they can have big conversations now. Yeah. But it was interesting also at his wake. Anybody that spoke about him, and, and it was a beautiful service that they did. Uh, they, everybody says, man, he was a pain in the neck to deal with. I can't tell you how many times I fired that guy from the band. I fired him twice. <laughs> did you? You know, actually, he left one of his his uh, extension cords, and he must have called me every day for three months. Where's my extension cord? It was in the back of my car, which I kept forgetting to bring into the radio station to give to you. I think I did finally give Finally, it. he did get it, yeah. You get it to him? So interestingly, too, um, at his um, service, his daughter comes out. She says, I'm just going to do a little performance. Um, the last week of Dad's life, he taught me how to play this on the ukulele. So she got up and she played something by the Beatles. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, it was absolutely spectacular. And, and everybody was starting to tear up. Was that the first time she'd ever played anything? On a ukulele just in front of her? Just that week. So 
that was the uh, clip from the musical showcase that Bob played. <laughs> the one you dropped the guillotine on? Yes, I <laughs> chopped it right. Well, you know, we heard that here in the studio, but I know for a fact that Adam is an excellent engineer, and he's going to fix that up, and it's going to be really neat when um, it comes on the um Oh, I know he's going to fix it. Get to fix it in the mix. And that is why I work with Adam, because he is state-of-the-art, knows his stuff. We can see. it. it. You fix it, you mix it, and then you quix it? Yeah, you bust and make it, he fixes it. So that piece of um, music that we played for Bob, um, you were going to tell me a little bit more about... um, the epi, or are we done on the epi topic? Or? No, he just had that relationship to the Epiphone family, and uh, he always swore that he would get the Epiphone name back and where he would be running the company. Oh. Yeah. Is that is that after he had a couple of No, he, he, he felt that way all the time. He, he always felt that way. He always felt that he was going to get it back. Well. But and, and in the meantime, he just played really good music. But like I said, he was a real difficult person to um, work with. We got into a couple of scrapes, just like anybody else who knew him. Well, you know, you and I've had scrapes. Um, mm-hmm. But the, the sign of a real friendship is being able to come back from the scrapes Absolutely. and still be able to be professional and do your job or play your music together. And in this case... Um, he he did a splendid job. So I do remember at the end of that song, somebody yelled out in the audience, that sounded just like Clapton. And Bob's reply to that was, uh, no, Clapton sounds just like me. And and I would have, I'm, I'm going to see if we can't find that and maybe uh, Adam will splice that in at the end of the uh, recording, kind of as our going out. But and, definitely um, something Bob would have said. Yeah. And but he could play, and and he knew he could play. He knew he could play. Yeah. He just showed up, set his stuff up. He loaned us some of his uh, equipment, his amps and his mics or something, and played his thing. And he was a little crotchety, but he was happy when he was playing, and everybody was mesmerized. Yeah, so. and to watch him pick up a fiddle is just another thing of that, beauty. That is an interesting piece of information. Now, I can't even picture that, but I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah, I've, I had seen him do quite a few things. I wonder um, if there's any video out there of that, maybe on YouTube? No, I think I might have audio from um, Ridgefield Gone Country that we had played in 15, 2015, and... Bob did some fiddle work with another band. Uh, it was called Pedal 12. That was a, a, a band that Bill Flash put together. They were on just before us when we played there. So I'm looking at the list of, um, look at how I jump. Boom. I'm looking at the list of things you wanted to talk about, and this kind of confuses me, but I'll just ask it out and you tell me. Well, let's what see it if it confuses me too. Yeah, right. Well, you are, what did you say? 60 something. Video work with Chris O'Leary. Video work, yeah. I Willa, did lo- lots of video work. Um, I was going to tell Adam about this before. Uh, I got a call from Jeremy Baum, you know, the keyboard player? Jeremy Baum. Yeah, a keyboard player, great he- keyboard player in the Valley. He asked if I wanted to shoot some video of Chris O'Leary band at the Falcon. So um, I grabbed two Canon G12s from Comcast and a bunch of videotapes, and an old Sony handheld. And I also bought a G12 for my, a G, GL2, sorry, it's a Canon GL2 for myself. And we went up there with the four cameras, and we shot four angles, except in the second set, we just shot three angles. We left one stagnant, and then we walked around with, with two cameras and just shot two more angles. And I edited all that footage in Final Cut Pro 7, which is a horror show to edit. Because you got to line up all the time code. And it was professionally recorded by Dave Gross, who owns Fat Rabbit Studios in New Jersey. He brought all his gear up to the Falcon, set every, all the levels and recorded it. And he mixed it. So I edited the video down to one hour. Oh. And sent it over to Dave Gross, and he chopped up his music and gave me the final version. So 
I did this on a budget of zero dollars with hopes that it was going to get released. It never did get released. And probably because it wasn't shot in high def, you know, but we were using old barred cameras. So, you know, yeah. at least it was widescreen. So it looked halfway decent and it sounded spectacular. And uh, so I just posted it up on YouTube. And I've done a lot of other video work for, um, you know, like I Front Row Dave. Oh, Front Row Dave. Yep. We know him. And um, I also edited Willa's video that was shot at Daryl's house in January of... Uh, Excuse me, February 2017. That was nine cameras. I had to edit nine different angles. And it was all uh, 4K resolution. I had had to buy an extra hard drive. It was 1.75 terabyte of footage that I had to edit down. That is very confusing conversation you're leading me into now, Paul. This but I noticed Adam was, was listening. Yeah, <laughs> Adam's listening, and he's interested. But you bring up Willa, and I know we want to get some a conversation in about Willa and also play Mama Needs Some Company. So I think, Adam, we're kind of running down our time, aren't we? So want to give us a quick on your... Your relationship with Willa, how you met her, or anything like that, and then we'll... Willa, I met when she was singing backup for um, Chris O'Leary Band. That's the first time I met her. Um, then she struck out on her own, mm-hmm. and we had seen her a few times. Uh, Petey Hopp was playing guitar, Doug Abramson on bass, and um, um, Scott Melissa on keyboards, and there was a different drummer at the time, but he's he's been replaced. Um a lot of the names have changed. Like Carl always playing guitar now. Um, but Willa went out on her own, and she has this absolutely beautiful voice. You know, she can sing Aretha. She can sing anything. And to watch her on the stage, she knows precisely what she wants from the band. So she cues the band at all times, and that's what most singers do anyway. Yeah. But, you know, you'll know when your time is coming. She's She's just fabulous. And she released Better Days, which came out um, last year, 2017. Came out in 2017. And she's got a new one that she's just finishing up right now. And uh, the first one was all a lot of horns on it. Some uh-huh. Great, great stuff. Uh, and she did some really wonderful shows. Um, she did the one at Daryl's house where she was 13 pieces on the stage. Yikes, great. they all fit on there. They did. I mean, it's a nice stage. Yeah, that's a. It's not that big though. It's bigger than it used to be when well, it was the choir. It's deeper. It's deeper. Well, you know the the Lanza insurance clock is telling me that it's we're winding down now on time, and I want to thank the Lanza Insurance Agency for that clock. And if you need anything for your insurance uh, needs, you should go there. Um, and it's not coming out exactly the way I want it to. But don't forget to thank them for that clock, too. Oh, there's two clocks here, right? You're looking at one as well. So um, Lanza Insurance Agency is a state farm agency. And if you are watching or listening on YouTube, there will be some clips. And they'll give you the information on how to reach them. And also here at there, I want to thank hereatthere.com for their sponsorship. And I want to thank Paul Toscano for coming in tonight and talking with us. Thank you, Jackie. Adam, thank you for doing such a fine job thank you adam and thank you everyone for listening and now we're going to take a here i'm going to take a here there we're going to take a listen to willa vincator 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 mama needs some company Woohoo!
upon the 